If you asked most Americans to point out the Isle of Man on a globe, it might take them a while. The 30-mile-long island sits in the middle of the Irish Sea, with England to the east and Ireland to the west. It once was the seat of a Viking kingdom. Today, Britain's King Charles is head of state, or Lord of Man. People born there are known as Manx, and the Isle has its own unique language and a tailless cat also called Manx. A few hundred years ago, it was known as a haven for smugglers. The buccaneers are gone. Bankers have now turned the Isle into a tax haven. But what drew us to the Isle of Man was not the beauty or the banking, but a hair-raising annual event that at first glance seems totally out of place on this tiny jewel of an island. The story will continue in a moment. With emerald fields and rugged coastlines dotted with ruins of medieval castles, the pace of life on the Isle of Man is slow, even sleepy, for 50 weeks of the year. But for two weeks, starting at the end of May, it becomes one of the loudest, fastest, most dangerous places in sport. It's like nothing else, no matter what you've done in your life, until you see a bike do the, what we're doing here, nothing compares at all. Like in places it shouldn't wheelie, it's like, wow. British motorcycle racer Peter Hickman is one of the best in the world. And a 13-time winner of a race known as the Isle of Man TT short for both tourist trophy and time trial. Not long before we met Hickman, we watched him fly over the first jump on the course at a place known as Ago's Leap. We saw you go by Ago's Leap today, and truly, it was a blur. It was just like, <laughs> like a, a speeding bullet. How, how fast do you think you were going when you went by there? Agos leaps around 185 to 195 mile an hour, somewhere around there. It's top gear. Besides the blinding speeds, what truly makes the Isle of Man TT unique is that it is run on public roads that are open to normal traffic until just 30 minutes before racing begins on a 37 mile course that covers much of the island, running through villages and pastures, with riders taking more than 200 turns just inches from rock walls and buildings and residents. You literally race through a village and it just feels like you shouldn't be doing it, but we're allowed. <laughs> On the Isle of Man. <laughs> On the Isle of Man. <laughs> There's more to say about the TT, much more, but first, what is it about this tranquil isle that produces such a wild and improbable race? The people on the island like to do things their own way. Katrina Mackey moved here from Scotland 15 years ago. Well, that's a really... And now teaches university students the history of the Isle of Man. She told us over the centuries the blood and cultures of English, Irish and Viking clashed and mixed here to create the unique Manx identity. The Manx see themselves as, you know, we're not English, we're not Irish, we are Manx. From what you're telling me, the Isle of Man seems to always be finding its own path. That streak seems to define it. Yeah, it still has that streak of independence. And a lot of it does come from its Norse heritage. The Norse, Vikings, sailed south from Scandinavia more than a thousand years ago in search of places to conquer. In 1079, Norse Gaelic ruler called Godred Crovan invaded the Isle of Man for the third time, third time lucky for him. This was the seat of the Norse yeah. kingdom for a while? For a while, yeah, that's right. Contrary to their reputation, the Vikings didn't just plunder and move on. On the Isle of Man, they established a sort of parliament called the Tinwald that still makes the laws here. It is the longest continuous running parliament in the world, and it is an important part of the Manx identity. Oh, 
Another important aspect of identity is the Manx language, which natives have been speaking and singing for nearly 1,500 years. Ruth Kagan Gell works at a cultural organization dedicated to preserving and popularizing the Manx language. Oh my God, that was beautiful. Thank you. Why does it matter to, to save the language? My ancestors spoke Manx, so for me, it's, it's a nice way of feeling like I'm connected. I think if we were to lose Manx, we'd be so much the poorer for it. Let's try and do that all together. Hello. Manx nearly was lost. By the 1950s, after more and more English speakers visited or settled on the isle, there were fewer than 200 Manx speakers left when a concerted effort began to revive the language. And I'm going to teach you how to say Jameis. The rebirth of the language has been described as sort of like a phoenix-like story. Yeah, the definitely. True? Yeah, it's a strong, it's a resilient language. And I think there's more and more pride all the time with people embracing Manx and seeing it as a really, really good thing. But it is just like that, the, the phoenix rising out of the ashes. It didn't die. It got perilously close. That's squidgy. OK, we all ready, Velshuerlu? Today, right. Ruth okay. kagan Gell teaches adult Manx classes at a local pub. This, and this means knowledge. While just a few hundred yards down the road, four- and five-year-olds are learning to count in a Manx language immersion school. It's really exciting seeing people going from having, you know, one or two words in their very first lesson. You know, you're starting to introduce yourself, Mish Ruth, you know, Koyos, who are you? And you'd say Mish Bill back. Mish Bill. Mish Bill, yeah. Right. Yendersach, well done, that's good. <laughs> Manx is spoken when the Tinwald, the Isle of Man's Parliament, meets in ceremonial session. For centuries, the Tinwald has charted the Isle's unique path. It was the first legislature in the world to grant women the vote. It especially asserts Manx independence in matters of taxation. England in the mid 17th century had raised its customs duties. The Isle of Man didn't, so you have tobacco and tea and brandy and rum coming from Europe and elsewhere into the Isle of Man that were then taken from the island in small boats and smuggled into England or Scotland. But the smuggling was known as um, running. The running trade, or the trade, yes, the trade. absolutely, yeah. And that was very lucrative. Very, very lucrative, yeah. It was at that point that the British government decided, OK, we really need enough. to do something about this. Enough is enough. Yeah. yeah. The British effectively took control of the Isle of Man. And to this day, the British monarch is head of state and has the right to veto any Manx law. In practice, that power is almost never used, and the Isle of Man fiercely guards its independence. You know, we have our own tax laws, um, and the island is very, very proud of that. In a way, what was going on in the 17th and 18th century, the, the trade, hmm. was uh, this place was kind of a tax haven back you, then. In, in some respects, I guess you could call it that. And um, it is again today. It is again today, yeah. Um, most companies don't pay any corporation tax at all. Zero. Zero. The level of income tax is much lower than it is elsewhere, so we have a top rate of income tax of 20%. We have a lot of people living on the island who are very, very wealthy, who pay relatively little tax on the island than they would elsewhere. The Isle's total population is a little more than 80,000. But many of the world's biggest banks have a branch here. The owners of more than 1,000 private jets avoid millions of dollars in taxes by registering them on the Isle of Man. Just as it has tried to make its tax laws attractive, the Isle of Man has worked long and hard to attract tourists. By the 1880s, 1890s, a week's holiday by the sea had become a, a British institution, really. And by 1913, just before the First World War, we were seeing 600, 650,000 wow. people visiting the island every summer. Huge, huge, huge numbers of visitors. 
Among those visitors around the turn of the 20th century were a few wealthy people who brought with them newfangled machines called motor cars. The speeds they were doing were were quite phenomenal. According to Matthew Richardson, curator at the Manx National Heritage Museum, these were the founding fathers of the race now known as the Isle of Man TT. The TT began actually as a car race. That's where we get the the name Tourist Trophy from because it began as a race for touring cars. Uh, There was no opportunity to race cars in the United Kingdom at this time because Parliament there had banned road closures for racing. And you guys just said, yeah, sure, we'll close our roads down. Well, partly the Lieutenant Governor was the cousin of the Chairman of the Royal Automobile Club, Sir Julian Ord. The Isle of Man economy at that time was heavily dependent on tourists coming here and he thought that having a racing event would only bring more tourists, and he he was proved to be absolutely right. Was he ever? When we come back, we'll see how and why the Isle of Man TT has become a bucket list destination for motorcycle riders and racing fans from all over the world. The Isle of Man's unique culture and Manx language set it apart, but it's the race known as the TT that has really put it on the map. First held in 1907, it is the most dangerous motorcycle race on Earth. More than 250 riders have been killed over the years. Yet every year, fans flock across the Irish Sea to watch, and racers clamor for an invitation to ride. The story will continue in a moment. Like, it is my life. That's the thing. It always has been since I was a wee boy. My dad sat me on the hedge. I watched this bike go past, and I thought, that's what I want to do when I grow up. Super Sport and Super Twins to the start line, please. Richard Milky Quayle was born and raised on the Isle of Man, a Manxman through and through is how he puts it. In 1997, he got his wish to race in the TT, and five years later, he won it. So what is it like as a Manxman to win the TT? Well, I mean, there's only ever been three of us that have ever done it in the 118 years or whatever, so... I think it's a bit like when you, you go to do your washing on your trousers and you have you stick your washing and you, you just, I'll just check the pockets before putting your, you reach in there and you'll find £10 and you like, oh yeah, I've got £10 richer. <laughs> well, if you can multiply that by a million, that's what it's like to win the TT. It's just like, woohoo! <laughs> the actual prize money is minuscule compared to other professional sports. The winner of this year's top class TT race won just over $30,000. There are five classes in all, dictated by the power of the motorcycle and the number of laps. Riders are constantly braking, shifting, and twisting the throttle thousands of times every lap. Then there is the sidecar race, three-wheeled contraptions that scream around the course with a driver and a passenger whose job is to throw their weight around every curve, just inches off the ground. You need only to look at old photos to see how the race has changed. Early sidecar outfits looked like what you might see on the street. Today, they resemble angry mutant bobsleds. The first motorcycles were basically bicycles with engines strapped on. Today's bikes are bullets, ridden by some of the top pro racers in the world. I'm trying to beat the clock, not the person in front of me, effectively. Milky Quail gave us a taste of what it's like to ride the course with a bike mounted on a simulator. Up towards the black dub, so got a little oh, left. This is incredible. And an actual lap playing on a screen in front of him. Over to the left. And then over to the right. Oh, it takes so much physical effort to get the thing to turn through there. 
So we've got, this is Sylvie so straight now, Bill. This is one of the fastest points on the circuit. Everything's a blur going by here. 190, 195, 200 miles an hour here. This is nuts, you know that, right? <laughs> well, it's, it's fun though, it's, it's fun, Bill. He knows a lot of people won't get his definition of fun. Now, the last time you raced as, as a rider was, uh, what, 20 years 20 ago? 20 years ago now, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It nearly killed you, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah, it did, but I mean... What it, happened? I made one little mistake and... What, what, what was your mistake? I just literally yeah. entered the corner too early. So I just caught the rock face with my shoulder. And it just snagged and it pulled me then to the wall on the right and then I threw it over and hit the wall on the left. And, yeah, that's the, that's the flip side of the coin, isn't it? It's just, you know, when it goes bad, it, you know, it, it can hurt you. The crash in 2003 ruptured his spleen and punctured both of his lungs, among other injuries. I remember I was lying in the hospital bed and a journalist came in to see me and we wanted an interview and stuff. And he was trying to put words in my mouth like, oh, well, you, you must hate it then, mustn't you? you? must. It's dangerous, you must want to get it stopped. And I was like, you are? Well, why would I want to stop it? It's, the best thing in the world that anyone could ever want to do. Why would I want to stop it just because it hurt me? The only way of making this event safe is to not do it. You know, if we're going to race sports bikes through towns and villages on public roads, that inherent danger is going to be there. Okay, guys, ready? Paul Phillips is the man who has been in overall charge of the Isle of Man TT for the last 15 years. <laughs> Some people in our audience who are not really familiar with the race would be surprised at the, the casualty statistics. 250 casualties over the years, six just last year. You know that's got some people you know, sort of howling that this race is too dangerous, it, it shouldn't be. I totally understand that um, and you know this event really does embody the sort of uh, human spirit nobody is forced to come and do this and this event does kind of give human beings an opportunity to kind of test themselves and push their boundaries and, and live their lives to the absolute limit like the ultimate expression of free will yeah yeah even if that free will can get you killed so it seems yeah to be honest as a rider you don't really think about it Hickman takes his third senior TT. Peter Hickman has won 13 TT races, including this year's marquee race, the senior TT. 225 miles over six grueling laps. As a rider, we have already accepted, if someone's here and riding and signed up, we have already accepted what that consequence is if we make a mistake. Yeah, the course is all good all the way to Ramsey. Organizers of the TT have taken steps to minimize risk where they can. Riders are sent off the start line at 10 second intervals to make space between them. But passes with not an inch to spare still happen. Perhaps the most significant change has been to strictly limit the number of racers to just over 30 sidecar teams and 100 solo riders. How important is it just to determine that a rider is good enough to be on this course? Very. One of the things when I first started working on the TT was that that wasn't the case. You know, there were people coming here who were ill-prepared. Now, there's a strict protocol for would-be first-time racers, and Milky Quail is a key part of it. The apex is there, see? Okay. He first takes newcomers around the course in a car. So then what's gonna happen is... Then, during practice week, he leads them on an actual lap to see how they perform and whether they can keep up. You ever have someone you're taking around and you go, they're not ready? Yeah. I remember going behind, when I was behind Milky Quail on my initiation lab, and I actually screamed in my helmet. I'm like, this is crazy. Rennie Skaysbrook made Milky's cut. An Australian now living in California, he is a full-time motorcycle journalist and a part-time racer who was invited here after winning the Pikes Peak race in the US. His first TT was last year when six riders were killed. There's some really awful stuff that happens here. You can't sugarcoat it. But on the other side, you know, it is the most incredible place to ride a motorcycle. Like, the danger's up here, 
The exhilaration is up here. It's so unlike anything else. You ask any motorcyclist and you say the old man TT and they all, they all know. During practice week, we met one of the ferries. The primary means of getting to the island and watched as hundreds upon hundreds of racing fans rolled off. To accommodate the 40,000 fans who come to the race, almost every soccer and rugby field becomes a campground. And the roads, while they're open, are clogged with riders. The fan can run off the boat, sit at the side of the road, watch the hero go past. Half an hour later, after the road's open, they can ride on the same track. It's the best. It is the best, Bill. You know, it's the best. There's no admission fee to watch, and the paddock is open to all. <laughs> Here, fans can touch the stars. One black shirt, one blue shirt. But one visit to the merchandise tent... Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Cheers is all it takes to know that this is a commercial bonanza for the Isle. And make no mistake, that's what it exists for. It exists for economic reasons. It exists to bring people to our island and for no other reason. It doesn't exist because we like motorbikes. We do like motorbikes, but that's not why it exists. One rider was killed in this year's TT, 46-year-old Spaniard Raul Torres Martinez. That there was just one death after the six racers killed in 2022 was a relief to organizers, but also a reminder of the risk that has run through these winding roads for more than a century. A lot of people don't grasp just how wild the event really is. I mean, I'm a part-time racer, I can steer a bike okay, but I'm not the level of these guys. You know, I mean, they do stuff that I just go, I have no idea how you do it. Wow, that's brave. Yeah, that's heart in your mouth. Peter Hickman is one of those guys. This year, while winning four races, he set a new all-time speed record for a single lap. This makes me feel alive. Makes you feel alive? Yeah. You can't just leave it like that. You gotta <laughs> <laughs> Expound, explain, what do you mean? I think you can only really appreciate life if you're putting yourself into places that risk it.